Thanks. We're starting up here. Yeah, bring us in. Great. Thank you and welcome to the 10th Annual Harlem Book Fair. Our conversation this morning is about, uh, about uh, black publishing, uh, 40 years of black publishing. Actually, in aggregate, these publishers have a total of over 120 years of experience in telling our stories, working under the radar, working in publishing before it was all the vogue. To my immediate right is Tony Rose, uh, publisher of uh, Amber Books, Amber Book Communications Group. Uh, to his right is Paul Coates, Black Classic Press. Uh, to his right is Wade Hudson of Just Us Books and his wife and partner, Cheryl Willis Hudson, and Kasahun Chekol, the publisher of Africa World Press and Red Sea Press. And what we want to do this morning is just talk about uh, what publishing is, what it represents for us as a community, uh, what has been its triumphs and travails, uh, and just the conversation about urban fiction because it seems to have taken so much of the publishing space for us. In fact, it has gone a long way in almost branding the community. Uh, and some feel that there is a, an imbalance there that uh, uh, is either cyclical or should be in some way balanced now. So we want to talk about their experiences and, and what you see as a future of black, black public publishing, especially given the fact that one thing that we know is that the majors, the larger publishers, often use the smaller independents, sort of their farm club. Uh, they look to see who's doing well, they track the numbers, they make offers, and uh, more often than not, they're offers that can't be refused. Uh, how does that impact you? How does that impact your viability as publishers and the, con you know, the continuation of uh, your work as publishers? Uh, who'd like to uh, begin in that conversation? <clears throat> Max, I'd like to begin the conversation, um, if you will, and with the permission. Uh, these guys are nodding their head, but I'm really looking at Cheryl. Go <laughs> right ahead, Paul. <laughs> Seriously, I, I, I want to uh, begin with uh, contextualizing the premise of 40 years of black publishing, first of all. <clears throat> I beg your pardon. I want to begin by contextualizing uh, the premise of 40 years of uh, black publishing. And I want to contextualize it uh, because it's wonderful to celebrate uh, the contributions of, of these publishers who are here uh, today. But our conversation always has to be a conversation uh, that extends beyond the, the here and now and extends back and constantly gives uh, tribute to, to those whose shoulders we stand on. So I, I want to just bring our 40 years into uh, the context of, of, a, of a history in this country, publishing history in this country, that began in resistance, um, that in many ways continues, and, and the 40 years we're looking at here is a reflection of uh, the resistance that we've had to oppression, uh, second-class citizenship, uh, sl enslavement in this country. Our earliest publishers, our earliest publishers, going back to folks like David Walker in the, in the early uh, 1820s, recognized the need for us as a people to have a voice that was free and independent and clearly spoke for ourselves. And they depended on books, pamphlet, news journals, and whatever way they could get into press to do that. This 40 years that we're talking about, and there's a whole, I don't want <clears> to, <throat> 
slight anyone, uh, pe people like Frederick Douglass, the, our, our whole history, our whole tradition of slave narratives when we talk about black publishing, we have to include that. And when we look at this 40 years of black publishing, this 40 years stands, really stands on um, the shoulders of that tradition. In fact, uh, the, the folks that we're celebrating here on this panel are the survivors out of the most recent phase of that because so many black publishers came forward who are no longer around. When we look, uh, the publisher that's not here today is Haki Mahadabudi, and he, in fact, would have been uh, who we would have celebrated as 41 years of black publishing. He's not here, but even before Haki, there's a long stream of black publishers having roots uh, certainly, many of them having roots right here in Harlem. Whether you, you know, one of my favorites is Jay Rogers, who is based here in Harlem and who sold books for many years and never could get a major publisher to touch one of his books until after he died. John Henry Clark did that. But that's the tradition that, that these publishers, when we talk about 40 years, emerges out of. And any conversation that we have going forward, any conversation that we have about what's coming next or what the state of uh, black publishing is, should be referenced onto that. We need to look at this 40 years as being a small chapter, a really a small chapter in our publishing and our tradition of support for black publishing because it, we don't have a publishing history, we don't have a publishing tradition without, in fact, the black community, because the black community has always supported us, and we hope that you will continue to do that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> so that, that's my two cents to start it <laughs> off. <laughs> yeah, uh, Paul, I second what you've just said. Um, it is so important that we recognize those who came before us, and we do stand on their shoulders. Um, the uh, first editorial for uh, Freedom Journal, in fact, said that we uh, wish to plead our own cause because too long others have, have spoken for us. And that's what we are trying to do as publishers, give voice uh, to those uh, who do not, do not have a voice. And I think that... I'm sorry, wait, excuse me one second. I, I would like to make requests of the audience that we not use flash while we are videotaping. Thank you so much. And I think it, you cannot really recognize us without recognizing those who came before us, the Frederick Douglasses and the, the J.A. Rogers and the Langston Hughes, those people who, some many of them self-published, and they took their published works to the community, to Harlem and two different places around the country. And we cannot really talk about, as Paul said, um, our history, our tradition of publishing without recognizing those. But that having been said, I think we also need to recognize the efforts of a Paul Coates and the efforts of a Haki Mahabuti in terms of carrying on, and, and Cassone Shikola and Tony Rose, uh, of carrying on that tradition. Because we are constantly bombarded with things that will try to stop us from carrying on that tradition. And uh, we do need the support of the black community uh, to help us continue to be uh, uh, important, you know, uh, not just publishing books, but important players in helping us identify and recognizing the issues and the concerns that we as a community uh, must deal with. And, if I can and that's my two cents. Let me add mine in here. Um, when uh, last night when we were at the uh, uh, Phyllis Wheatley Awards, which was wonderful, Max, and uh, a very important award here at the Holland Book Fair, which is a phenomenon in the, in the country and in the world, um, it mentioned that over in 200 years of, uh, which in my estimation, 200, maybe 50, 225 years of publishing in America, um, that African Americans uh, did not read or, or, or buy books, which is a very false statement because that's all we do is write and read and have been for the last 200 years and more in America. Uh, we self-published our plight all through the 19th century uh, from Frederick Douglass's memoirs to uh, memoirs by just about everybody uh, that, was, that had something to say about that right up to W.B. Du Bois, and uh, in my estimation, I mean, we've been here in America for a long time, uh, writing, uh, searching, reading, 
try and understand who we are here and what America is about and what it means for us. My grandmother was a fervent follower of John Johnson, of uh, Ebony Magazine and Johnson Publications fame. And she said, we must always support Mr. Johnson. And we must always subscribe to Ebony Magazine. And when she passed, one of the things and treasures that I found when I cleaned out her house was a massive amount of Negro Digest uh, books going back from 1940 to 1945. Uh, through the years, uh, I would say about 18 years now, or maybe longer, 20, over 20 years since I found them, I have been giving them out to certain individuals. I think I gave one to you, Max, a few years ago. And they're treasures, the Negro Digest, Ebony Magazine, the book publishing uh, work that we've done in America, all of us going back, and as I said, 200, 100 years, magazine publishing. Uh, we search and give back our stories, uh, our lives, our lifestyles, our history. In fact, Johnson Publications to me is the modern day bestion of our history as is the, where you're sitting in, as is W. Paul Coates there last night, the bastion of our history, the place, the founding of our history in this massive building of 2,500 African American books written for and about us right here in this building. Take a tour, it's beautiful. Thank you. Uh, so I have a, a question about children's book pu publishing, excuse me, and there is no black Harry Potter. I'd like to know why, or at least why you think that such a phenomena has not existed emanating from a black cultural experience. Um, I think that uh, we have to look at uh, the history of our struggle and the history of the development of, of fantasy and go back to the legacy of our, our roots in terms of creating the kind of reality in a children's literature that would sort of reflect what uh, Harry Potter does. It's, it's, it's all Harry Potter is based on mythology and a modern telling of fantasy uh, story and tales. And in terms of the development of children's literature, we really need to know what the canon is. We need to develop more writers. And I think that there are people who have written and are writing who have the power and imagery uh, of the phenomena called Harry Potter. Virginia Hamilton, for example, was a fabulous writer. She's now passed on, but she wrote Many Thousand Gone and The Planet of Junior Brown and um, wonderful, wonderful books that um, may not be in the public eye. I think it's important to remember that literature exists whether you have a marketing strand or not, and part of the phenomena of Harry Potter is the marketing. It's not the literature itself, um, if I may say so. And I think Harry Potter is a, the, the series and the writing, at least in the first uh, volume, was wonderful and had flights of fantasy. But I think we do. It's a matter of access and it's a matter of finding the stories that reach larger audiences and that have marketing dollars behind them to drive those numbers. So would you mind if I develop that just a bit more here? Uh, in terms sure. of uh, uh, the crossover effect of a Harry Potter, which means that you know, whenever I saw um, Harry Potter uh, commercials or, or news situations on Harry Potter, there was always African-American children involved in that phenomenon. And, you know, along with the European-American community, the African-American community, the Asian-American community, Native American community. So what you're talking about is, a, is probably a a situation of a crossover situation coming from a Just Us books that massively entails all of America's cultural aspects. Yeah, and, and, and I think the important point, though, that Cheryl made is marketing. Yeah. Uh, Scholastic put a lot of money Millions. behind that book. Mm -hmm. uh, so these kinds of successes don't just happen right. by accident. Uh, every once in a while, a book will take off on its own, but Harry Potter had, I mean, a lot of money behind it and a lot of marketing strategy. It was a well-written book and interesting and engaging characters. Uh, and uh, so kids were 
hooked by it, but I think marketing accounts for a large share of why uh, it was so successful. And I think that, we, if I could add, I think that we need to kind of define ourselves, continue to define ourselves. Um, I don't know that Justice Books wants to publish a Harry Potter per se. I think that we need to continue to reflect and think about what stories we need to tell. And that's, people point to Harry Potter because it's a commercial success, and right. we would love to have that commercial yeah, success, yeah, yeah. but our primary uh, aim as publishers of black books for children is to tell our stories, to have uh, black children see themselves in books. And that, to a large extent, is something that has only happened in the last 40 years. Um, before 1960, before the uh, mid-1960s, you would very, very seldom find one black child in a book. And that black child may have been marginalized. So part of what our mission is, is to bring wonderful stories about the diversity of African American experiences to, uh, to children, for children, so children can see themselves and see the possibilities that they have and develop those in terms of what our heritage is and will be. Hey,